1940s women include my mother in the dark suit and her sisters on a Sunday after church. The military-inspired suits and the white dress are typical garments for the Second World War. Almost a year after VE Day, these practical farm girls are dressed in their Sunday best. Basic needs include food, shelter, and clothing. It might seem irreverent to consider fashion in the context of war, but the upheaval war foists on society is always seen in the way people dress. Elements of uniforms are seen on civilian clothing. World War II disrupted the exchange of raw materials, which for clothing included wool, cotton, rubber, silk, plus leathers for shoes and durable clothing. With most able-bodied men involved in the war effort, lives of millions of women were juggled as they worked on the home front in jobs that required them to wear practical clothes. Through all of this, between air raids after the catastrophes and while experiencing loss, life goes on. And looking their best made people feel more normal. If we look back to problems that were solved under duress, we can find solutions that are learned in today's reduced circumstances. In the early 19th century, handsome style military uniforms trickled down and appear on these dresses as braids from 1815. Far away from any battlefield, the color and trim were a patriotic nod to the military. Similar braids and trim appear on this gown from 1865, inspired by uniforms from the Crimea War. And swags of teal cording on this plaid bodice are similar to the officer, a young Winston Churchill. On the outbreak of the First World War, women's clothes adapted to jobs replacing men who went to the trenches. Today, we have two articles of clothes from that conflict commonly worn. Before the war, only women wore watches that were bracelets. Men carried their watches in pockets, and the army wanted something much more accessible. They attached a watch dial to a web band and developed the man's wristwatch. In 1914, Burberry was commissioned by the War Office to adapt a heavy officer's coat to a waterproof cotton gabardine version, introducing the trench coat. September 3rd, 1939. Is it there? There it is. September 3rd, 1939, the United Kingdom declared war on Germany. In 41, the United States declared war on Japan, and by 45, 113 countries were involved. Britain's proximity to the, to the war put her in great danger. With most of mainland Europe occupied, Britain needed to take a realistic assessment of her survival possibilities. The principal strategy was to attack and sink supply ships that were bound for Britain, removing raw materials, damaging industrial capabilities, and starving the nation. Clothes were affected by the scarcity of materials, including rubber, silk, wool, leather, cotton, and nylon. Japan took over rubber plantations in the Dutch West Indies, 35% of world rubber, and 90% of American rubber was unavailable. The UK and the US eliminated any new rubber articles for civilians, including rubber boots, raincoats, and elastic of any kind. Agent silk was no longer available, requiring an alternative for parachutes. Silk had been used for ladies' stockings, undergarments, nightwear, men's ties, wedding dresses. All of these were replaced with other materials or done without. These are Australian sheep shearers. Britain bought the entire Australian wool harvest for the duration of the war. Wool had been extensively used for civilian and was needed for millions of uniforms. General Eisenhower is wearing his practical Ike jacket, cut down by his tailor from a wool field jacket. Millions of pairs of boots and leather flight jackets were needed, limiting leather for civilian shoes. Cotton was also used for uniforms. In the early 30s, the crew neck t-shirt was developed to wear under college football gear in Southern California. The Navy adopted this for sailors, and the Army followed with olive drab shirts. These sailors, 
on the USS Alcor in the South Pacific are wearing white cotton t-shirts and denim dungarees. My dad is the sailor on the far left, and he wore a white cotton uh, t-shirt for the rest of his life. Nylon became available to replace Asian silk for parachutes. In 39, DuPont launched a new filament, briefly used for women's stockings, thereafter called nylons. After Pearl Harbor, nylon was exclusively used for the war, prompting Fats Waller to write a tune. I'll be happy when the nylons bloom again. Cotton is monotonous to men. Only way to keep affection fresh, get some mesh for your flesh. I'll be happy when the nylons bloom again. In both the UK and the US, stockings were essential to dressing up. Fabric restrictions put a new emphasis on legs, and bare legs were considered inappropriate. A popular option was leg makeup, which included painting a dark seam up the back of the legs with an eyebrow pencil. Rayon could be used to imitate silk, wool, or cotton, and was filled the gap for civilian clothes. It was the first man-made, regenerated cellulose fiber made primarily from wood pulp. Popular in the 20s, it was essential in the 40s. It was comfortable, dyed well, and was cool for tropical climates. The manufacturing sector re retooled for the war production. Silk ribbon factories produced parachutes. Detroit built tanks and army trucks. Typewriter companies converted to machine guns. Underwear manufacturers sewed mosquito netting. Clothing manufacturing converted to military uniforms, and women filled in jobs once held by men. Munition workers, radio operators, pilots, shipbuilders, railway workers, and especially farm laborers. In Britain, the Women's Land Army recruited 80,000 women from London and the industrial north. They wore practical khaki shirts and jodhpurs, dark green wool pullovers, and sturdy shoes. Young women were trained in farm work and animal husbandry. This is Jean Harlow Flan from Liverpool, who spent the war years taking care of sheep in Lancashire. Jean lives here in Cache Valley, and her son Nick is on the faculty here at USU. Industrial doors opened for women, and it was discovered that they were good at careful, repetitive jobs done in small spaces. These women wearing work dungarees are riveting the underside of a bomber. Hair was tucked up in caps or under bandanas to keep it free from machinery and prevent disaster. Norman Rockwell illustrated the most famous riveter. Rosie is posed with her welding goggles and her sandwich, like the prophet Isaiah on Michelangelo's Sistine Chapel ceiling. Her penny loafered foot is firmly placed on a copy of Mein Kampf. Before the war, at the end of the 30s, women's fashions were retro-Victorian, with full skirts, large sleeves, and small waists, and upswept hairstyles reminiscent of the 1890s. With the outbreak of war, clothing took a dramatic change. Dresses and women's suits adapted a silhouette of uniforms. Full sleeves remained in the shape of shoulder pads, Waists were still narrow, but skirts were knee-length. Hair remained upswept. In Britain, as bomb shelters were being constructed, siren suits came into fashion. Similar to overalls worn by workers, the siren suit has a, had a zipper front, often a hood, and were worn over nightgowns or pajamas for late-night air raids. Here is a mother and son siren suited in front of their bomb shelter. Winston Churchill often wore a siren suit, and here is sub, sub, uh, second subaltern Elizabeth Windsor in her military overalls. In Britain, between September 39 and May 41, clothes more than doubled in cost. And on June 1, 1941, Britain began to ration clothes. The utility clothing scheme controlled this inflation. Cash and coupons from that year were required to buy clothes. The scheme began with 66 coupons per person per year at the beginning of the war, buying one entire outfit. 
But by the end of the war, only 20 coupons were available for a year. Non-ration clothes could be bought at a jumble sale or, or a rummage sale, and clothing exchanges were available for families to trade up in size for growing children. Well-established dress designers limited to specific restric restrictions created a small line of good quality, well-built, affordably priced garments. All utility items were marked with the CC41 label, which stood for Controlled Commodity 1941. The CC41 austerity measures for men limited trousers to a 19-inch circumference, no double-breasted suits, no elastic and waistbands, no zippers because of the, the metal shortage, no metal or leather buttons, no boys under 13 could wear long trousers. No pockets on pajamas. No trouser cuffs. The CC41 limits for women restricted no more fabric than two and three quarter yards for an overcoat, two yards for a suit, two yards for a dress. No trim, fancy stitching, or lace on women's undergarments. No metal bones or elastic on corsets or girdles. Skirts and dresses limited to three buttons, six seams, two pleats, and one pocket. No metal jewelry. Fashion has slowed to the tempo of a steady marriage, for it takes too many coupons to have clothes with which one falls in and out of love. In the United States, the production board introduced limited order L85. Similar to CC41, L85 reduced the amount of textiles and labor 15%. U.S. manufacturers were restricted with penalties of fines or imprisonment. With the War Production Board yardstick, clothing was carefully measured in production. Decorative styles were only on the front of garments, no big sleeves or all-round pleats, no wide belts, the American men's victory suit had similar limitations to the British. A lesser grade of wool was commonly used, and it was considered patriotic to wear such a suit. In the US, with a focus on the South Pacific, tropical prints were used. This Hawaiian print rayon dress is alive with bold colors, but retains the broad shoulders and narrow waist. Fewer dyes for clothes were available in the UK than the US. But these rayon scarfs by Jack Marr could be used as a kerchief or a bandana around the neck. Most Jack Marr prints had colorful, playful war propaganda designs. This home-sewed American pro-British dress has backward secret writing on it. It can only be read when you look in the mirror. It says, there'll always be in England. American Non-ration shoes utilize non-leather materials. The wedge soles were made out of cork, wood, or heavy cardboard. The upper parts were canvas, raffia, or jute. In Britain, the utility shoe was a well-constructed, generally lower, and very conservative style. Whereas most garments were rationed, hats were not. They were often made of felt, a non-ration material that could be cut and formed into a variety of whimsical shapes. <laughs> that, another felt hat that was very popular was the beret frequently seen on General Montgomery. In Britain, Make Do and Mend was a series of pamphlets from the British Board of Trade, illustrating how to extend the life of clothes from darning socks to re relining pockets or making slippers from old carpets. Women were asked to repair and renovate and were offered ideas for making new clothes out of old. Well, away in the military, many abandoned suits were taken apart and made into outfits for women and children. Mrs. So-and-so was a recurring character in the Make Do and Men campaign who instructed how to do specific tasks. Here are instructions how to make those carpet slippers. Other pamphlets gave suggestions on how to reinforce children's clothes or launder the much-needed rayon or how to replace your coupons and clothes if your home is destroyed in a bombing raid. Women were encouraged to look their best. The Board of Trade tried to make sure that women had access to makeup, like lipstick or mascara. 
The thought that was, this could help women feel more normal, give the military a boost, and thumb their nose at their adversaries. These are women in a salon having the makeup on their legs done. <laughs> One of the most valuable morale boosters in Britain was the royal family. The king and queen stayed in London during the Blitz, toured the bombed areas, and the queen dressed in cheerful pastel so as not to seem morose. She was so important for the British morale that Hitler was alleged to have called her the most dangerous woman in Europe. Back to our farm girls. Since I began working on this project, I discovered that the white dress on my Aunt Ethel was her wedding dress from six months earlier. And the suit on my Aunt Marie was for her wedding a year earlier. Both of these garments had become their Sunday best. Marie's jacket lapels were carefully made with one layer of wool, no interfacing or facing, with eighth-inch seam allowance, and the pockets are shaped like chevrons. What lessons can we learn from austerity? I recently watched a World War II American newsreel, and it's summed up by saying, don't waste anything, buy only what is necessary, salvage what you don't need, share what you have. Not bad advice for today. With the tightening of our collective belts after the financial crisis of 2008, I found that I was spending my money with more and more care. I too found myself with shrinking resources and expanding needs. I now think of discount stores like Ross and TJ Maxx as high end. <laughs> and I shop at, at thrift shops or, or the closet of my spare room where I keep old clothes. I also think that collectively, we can change our personal habits and make a significant impact in the use of our resources. And in the spirit of austerity, I'm wearing my Aunt Marie's wedding suit jacket today. Thank you.